start this video, we have to answer a very simple question. What is a privilege? And this can be found in a book called, well, it's more of like a pamphlet, pretty short. The more signifi, I'm not going to read all that. <clears throat> Basically, it's a report to the jury in charge and uh, committee of master embroiderers uh, of the uh, city uh, and, and I, I believe it's a dis district called Faubourg de Paris, so Paris. So Faubourg Berg is a city, word for city, at least in German. <clears throat> Anyway, it's uh, against a certain number of people, but in this book from 1735, it sort of defines the word privilege. Here on <clears throat> close to the last page, if not the last page, can't quite, can't quite remember, it states that a privilege, privilege is an exception to the rule. And a grace, or, uh, well, I suppose grace works, that the sovereign gives and imposes such conditions that are judged to be appropriate. I'm sort of translating the idea. I'm not translating it word for word, but that's the general idea anyway. So a privilege is something that is afforded by a sovereign. Which, of course, leads to the question, what is a sovereign? Here we can get some clarification on what a sovereign is, or at least the situation before the wars, many wars for independence. Well, I suppose there were other wars for independence that happened before the war for independence of the United States. But either way, this book, Trade and Empire, the British, British Customs Service in Colonial America, 1660 to 1775, sort of covers the tumultuous time period in which such questions were important, but they were asked, or at least they were clarified by a number of different uh, groups, organizations, uh, actors, or um, uh, ideas. Now, this book is written by Thomas E. Barrow, and it's the Harvard University Press, Cambridge, Massachusetts, 1967. Copyright 1967 by the President and Fellows of Harvard College, All Rights Reserved, distributed in Great Britain by Oxford University Press, London, Library of Congress, catalog, card number, blah, 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 printed in the United States of America. To my father and to my mother and father. Here we start on page 160, titled reform start of this chapter the freedom with which the american colonists evaded the acts of trade and navigation from time to time may have been momentary concern to the english authorities but what particular aspect of the illegal commerce persistently and increasingly irritated the british with only six years of peace between 1739 and 1763 much of this trade was in the form of direct communication with england's declared enemies in time of war such activities appeared to the english as not only illegal but traitorous Eventually, anger led to action, and a start was made on the road to reform. First reports on this trade were made as early as the War of Jenkins' Ear. In 1743, it was noted that Spanish goods were being introduced into the colonies, a commerce that was handled by naturalized French refugees living in the English plantations. Under cover of forged documents, they visited the Spanish possessions as subjects of the French king. Once the transactions were completed, they put aside that disguise and resumed their role as English colonists, importing the goods into the cotton plantations. It was even suggested that this commerce extended directly to trade with Spain itself, or to direct trade with Spain itself. With the entry of France into the war, the problem was compounded, since the northern colonists were accustomed to securing great quantities of molasses and sugar in the French islands. Provisions were the medium of exchange, yet to supply the French with such items enabled the enemy to withstand the efforts of the British Navy to starve them into submission. Such trade may have been an economic necessity for the northern colonies, but in another sense it was a flagrant violation of their duty as English subjects. 
a variety of maneuvers were employed to disguise this commerce. Now, this takes us to a different page, uh, 169, previous being page 160. Here it states, in August 1760, Benjamin Barons arrived in Boston as the new collector. Earlier in his career, as a London merchant, one of his own ships had been seized and condemned by the customs officers of Boston, which did not necessarily make for friendly relations between Barons and the older customs officers. More important, Barons was out to make his fortune. Previous collectors had done quite well, more through harmonious relations with the community of merchants than through strict attention to duty. The Jekylls, for example, who had been collectors at Boston from 1707 to 1740, had become respected members of the community. When the elder Jekyll died in 1733, the Boston Weekly Newsletter reported that by his courteous behavior to the merchant, he became the darling of all fair traders. With much humanity, he took pleasure in directing masters of vessels how they ought to avoid the breach of acts of trade. Sir Charles Henry Franklin, successor to the Jekylls, had become a leader of Boston society. As had been said by a customs officer earlier, such men were removed at a great distance from their superiors and often, continuing long in the same place, degenerate into creoles and at length forget mother country and her interests. Benjamin Barons, too, sought to in in to ingratiate himself with the local commercial aristocracy and made no effort to hide his plans. By the middle of October, Governor Bernard could report that the collector's intention of allying himself with the colonial faction which was opposed to effective enforcement of the Axis trade was common knowledge. Bernard tried unsuccessfully to reason with Barons, calling in the surveyor general and the judge of the Admiralty Court was equally ineffectual. Barons thought he had discovered a way to assume the leadership of the commercial community and was not to be dissuaded. The weapon Barons employed was to expose to public view the practice of making secret payments to informers. There was a legal argument on his side. By the Act of Six, George II, the king's one-third share of proceeds under the provision of that act were to go to the colony. Deducting the costs of the trials and the expenses of paying for informers had eaten into that share. Consequently, barons charged Charles Paxton, the officer who had been responsible for most of the seizures, with defrauding the province of its rightful money. At his instigation, the treasurer of the colony went to the Admiralty Court and demanded an accounting of the funds that should have accrued to the province. Meanwhile, barons obtained some of the bills of costs issued by the court to pay informers and showed them about the town to inflame the citizens. Bernard himself was attacked for his opposition to barons, the charge in his case being misconduct in the issuance of a register for a ship. The general meeting of the merchants was called and the bills of costs presented to the gathering Barons wrote Bernard that if he did not approve the resolve issued, resolves issued by the meeting, and also disavow Paxton and his party, his administration would be ruined. Barons' attitude was made clear in the testimony of Ebenezer Richardson, whom Barons charged with being an informer for Paxton. Barons reportedly told Richardson that if he would work for him, he would pay more than Paxton. Collector added that although he had many proofs of illegal activities, he would not seize the offenders because he did not wish to distressed the town and wanted to be free to call the people his friends. Barons was suspended from his office by the surveyor general, Thomas Lechmere, who told the collector he had done so, one, because Barons had tried to prevent execution of the laws of trade, two, because he had attempted to ruin the effectiveness of the admiralty courts, three, because he had tried to intimidate the customs officers, four, because he had attacked the authority of the governor, five, because he had he would, had been negligent in entering ships, and six, because he had attempted to rescue a ship seized by Paxton and publicly berated the sheriff who went to Paxton's aid. This seems solid grounds for removal, but the surveyor general wrote to the commissioners of the customs that he had not given the full articles of complaint to Barons. Instead, he gave him only general headings as above, because Barons was an expert at making use of every scrap of paper to influence public opinion in his favor. As a result of Barron's activities, five legal actions were commenced against the customs officers in Massachusetts. In Barron's v. Lechmere, the collector charged the surveyor general with suspending him on insufficient evidence. Barron's even had the aged Lechmere arrested until bail was arranged. In Barron's v. Craddock, the man who was appointed to take Barron's place during his suspension was charged with taking office on insufficient authority. In Barron's v. Paxton, the collector charged Paxton, who was surveyor and searcher, with improperly appealing over the head of his superior to the surveyor general. In Gravy Paxton, the colonial treasurer charged Paxton with defrauding of the revenue. And in Irwing v. Craddock, a man who earlier had been permitted by the Admiralty Court to settle a claim against a ship for half value attempted to get Paxton lost by suing the collector for false action. 
Governor Bernard, quite correctly, was distressed by these events, writing that his first year in office had been employed in defending the customs officers against the attacks of a party formed and supported by Mr. Barron's collector of port. The opposition's idea was to ruin the efficiency of the Customs Service by constant common law actions against individual officers. Bernard warned that it will depend upon the vigorous measures that shall be taken at home for the defense of the officers, whether there be any customs house here at all. However, such a total collapse of authority was not yet at hand. The invaluable Thomas Hutchinson, as Chief Justice, gave the heat of the moment time to abate and then, on appeal, reversed the unfavorable unfavorable decisions of lower courts. Only Oring v. Craddock went to London on further appeal, and an adjustment was arranged in the colony before a final decision on that case was made. Barons did not lack supporters. Thomas Lechmere, possibly hurried to his grave by his arrest and imprisonment, died in the middle of these events, and his successor, John Temple, for reasons of his own, saw to it that the detailed charges Lechmere kept from Barons were made known. Temple's actions, reaction was the beginning of a long contest between him and the governor and several other customs officials. A power struggle which nullified much of the efficiency of the Customs Service in the colony for years and which contribu contributed later to the failure of the American Board of Customs Commissioners. Certain Boston merchants also wrote to the Treasury on behalf of Barron's, but their support probably did him as much harm as good. Barron's involvement in the meeting of protest was merely coincidental, they said. He had been interested because the Crown had been defrauded and they had been concerned because the colony had lost some revenue. In a manner that was to become increasingly popular, merchants appealed to their English ancestors. From them we sprang, and like them we hate tyranny. Predictably, Barons was not reinstated in his office. Now, here's the interesting part about this situation that we find here, is that, well, an important note would be that in this case, things were handled in a more, or in a less fatal manner. But many examples in this book uh, show that there were, in fact, many violent confrontations. So it should not be uh, assumed from this one example that things were actually relatively well-mannered in the way things were handled. Also, this person appears to have come into this position with motives that, or with a plan that had already been formed, as it did mention he had originally had property seized by the original customs officers, so it does sound more like this guy is operating from a position of a vendetta, where he actually had planned to come in and sort of break up the uh, custom service that was going on here. But this is an example of a creative solution, and there are many examples of various ways that these people dealt with this stuff, but more importantly, as we'll find later, there is more to the story. Now, on a different page in this book, we get possibly the best quote that sums up almost perfectly the issue and the same things that we deal with today about the question of sovereignty. Here it states, the problem, simply, was whether such a slow step-by-step -step approach as that undertaken by Grenville was practical, given the well-documented rec record of colonial opposition, because, of course, the issue touched upon went far deeper than mere increase in taxes for the colonists. As Grenville himself later noted, the right of taxation and the question of sovereignty ever have been and must be inseparable, and the point was clearly understood by at least some in the colonies. In the first major reply to the action of the British government, James Otis, after disposing of the nonsensical, as he saw it, quote in uh, parentheses, distinction between internal and external taxation, observed that if taxes are imposed on any people without consent, they cannot be said to be free. This barrier of liberty being once broken down, all is lost. So here we get a direct correlation between taxation and sovereignty. This takes us to a document from the Congressional Record from the House, December 12, 1995, where it states, Taxes, taxes, taxes. Mr. Trafficant asked and was given permission to address the House for one minute and to revise and extend his remarks. 
Mr. Trafficant, Mr. Speaker, how can America be bankrupt? There are airport taxes, highway taxes, excise taxes, estate taxes, gas taxes, property taxes, income taxes, sale taxes, luxury taxes, nanny taxes, old taxes, new taxes, hidden taxes, inheritance taxes. There is even now a tax called a sin tax. I say to my colleagues, no wonder the American people are taxed off. The truth is that Congress is a Congress that taxes everything ultimately with tax freedom and will not balance anything. What is next? A budget tax. Is it any wonder that the American people are saying, kiss my taxes, beam me up, Mr. Speaker, I yield back the balance of my taxes. Now, this excerpt is clearly stated from a comical and could be construed anyway as a contemptuous uh, way to say this. The person is making a joke out of it. Never once did he mention that uh, about the constitutionality of such taxes, simply that there are quite a lot of taxes. And this is from 1995, whereas the other book that we just read was covering the period before the War for Independence, in which they indeed had all those same taxes listed that we have now. So let's go to that specific document itself the U.S. Constitution, keeping in mind the time period and the situations that formed the questions that became answered in the U.S. Constitution. When one reads that book, it becomes very clear exactly why everything is specifically in the Constitution, because all things that are enumerated or written into that document came from a position of experience and understanding about things that have come before and things that are still going on today because when we compare it to the time period we are in fact colonials just like those before the war for independence we are in the same situation that they were then no different it is nearly match point or point by point carbon copy of everything they had to deal with we are dealing with now and all of it is violating specific sections of the constitution that were put in place for that reason there is one section where it states no capitation or other direct tax shall be laid unless in proportion to the census or enumeration herein before directed to be taken that is stating that only the tax system stipulated in this document in proportion to the census can be done. Nothing else. No income tax. No, as it says before, sin tax. Ha ha ha. That's obviously a joke, sure. Um, no, well, I, we all, nearly all the quote unquote taxes that we have can't be done. And it's evidence that we, in fact, do not live in a sovereign nation. We live as colonials, not as free people. It also states, no tax or duty shall be laid on articles exported from any state. No preference shall be given by any regulation of commerce or revenue to the ports of one state over those of another, nor shall vessels bound to or from one state be obliged to enter clear or pay duties in another. Now, that section clearly stems from the Acts of Trade, which sought to make the Port of London, or at least in England specifically, a uh, requirement that ships would need to route through there, and they could not go straight from, say, the colonies to a, to a country in Europe. They had to pass by England. Also, it states, no money shall be drawn from the Treasury, but in consequence of appropriations made by law, and a regular statement and account of the receipts and expenditures, all public money shall be published from time to time. They certainly don't do that. That clearly is has to do with that one passage that we read in which barons showed the receipts and expenditures of payments to informants secretly. They wouldn't do that today for the same reason they did it then, which was under the guise of protecting the informants. However, 
that part in the stipulated in the Constitution specifically because of the clandestine payment of informants and the so-called representatives and agents of the government today still carry on that act in spite of this part of the Constitution because we are not living in a free and independent state. We simply live under the facade where, in fact, we are colonials. And then, of course, the last one is no titles of nobility. However, there's another level to this beyond just taxation, and that has to do with the monetary system itself. It states that Congress has the power to coin money, regulate the value thereof, and a foreign coin, and fix the standards of weights and measures. Now, they certainly don't do any of that because the Congress we have is not a legitimate one. We don't have a legitimate Congress. Because if we did, then they would actually make the money that we would use, which means that they would control the monetary system, which they don't. They control a fraudulent monetary system, which has nothing to do with the minting of coinage that is real, as in gold and silver in which there is a portion of the Constitution that states that debts will be paid with gold and silver coin, not with fraudulent banknotes or some other uh, trickery of currency. Now, here's the section that talks about how taxation is going to be done, and there is no other way that they can directly tax other than by this method. According to this document, which is the supreme law of the land, at least declared, but it is not properly enforced today because we have been living under a colonial provincial government, a puppet government, for a while now. Representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included within this union, according to their respective numbers, which shall be determined by adding to the whole number of free persons, including those bound to service for a term of years, and excluding Indians not taxed. They certainly don't exclude Indians today. Three-fifths of all other persons. The actual enumeration shall be made within three years or the after the first meeting of the Congress in the United States, and within every subsequent term of ten years, in such manner as they shall by law direct. Number of representatives shall not exceed one for every 30,000, but each state shall have at least one representative, and until such enumeration shall be made, the state of New Hampshire shall be entitled to choose three. Massachusetts 8, Rhode Island and Providence Plantations 1, Connecticut 5, New York 6, New Jersey 4, Pennsylvania 8, Delaware 1, Maryland 6, Virginia 10, North Carolina 5, South Carolina 5, and Georgia 3. Now notice, plantation unlike what we're taught in our mind programming history books that are mostly lies plantations were the was a word used specifically to refer to the colonies in general so new york would have been a plantation massachusetts would have been a plantation and all of these others listed right the carolinas they weren't specifically relating to a tract of land that people farmed on when which that we have the constantly repeated fraud of the massive slave population that farmed the entire country and they were all black, quote unquote. Well, that's just a, a fraudulent lie. But either way, the word plantation, as it was used then, referred to the colonies. So Rhode Island, instead of being a state, was referred to as a plantation. And I do not know what providence plantation what that would refer to that sounds like a state that we're not even talked about told about or colony that we're not told about in the history books either way it is listed here in the document along with all of these other familiar names now when we look at the amendments the early amendments the 13th and uh, subsequent ones are fraudulent the Eighth Amendment states excessive bail should not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. And it's very clear from the context of that book we just read why this portion is included. 
In the Ninth Amendment, it states the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Tenth Amendment, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. So it still comes into question what exactly, or who exactly, is sovereign, right? According to this document, who is sovereign if a sovereign can afford privileges and the Constitution affords certain rights and privileges, then logically the Constitution is the sovereign. So let's look further. In 18 U.S.C., United States Code, and these codes in many circumstances are violations of the Constitution and evidence of our colonial position rather than independent free person position. Anyway, in Title 18, Crimes of Criminal Procedure, Part 1, Crimes, Chapter 13, Civil Rights, Section 241, Conspiracy Against Rights, it mentions the privileges secured. It states, if two or more persons conspire to injure, oppress, threaten, or intimidate any person in any state, territory, commonwealth, possession, or district in free exercise or enjoyment of any right or privilege secured to him by the Constitution or laws of the United States, or because of having his so exercised the same, or if two or more persons go in disguise on the highway or on the premises of another, with intent to prevent or hinder his free exercise or enjoyment of any right or privilege so secured, they shall be fined under this title or in prison not more than 10 years, or both, and if death results from the act committed in violation of the section, or if such acts include kidnapping or an attempt to kidnap ag aggravated sexual abuse, or an attempt to commit aggravated sexual abuse or an attempt to kill, they shall be fined under this title or prison for more term of 10 years or for life, or both, or may be sentenced to death. Now, the Constitution does reference privilege as well, but either way, going back to the earlier definition from 1735, the privilege is a exception to the rule that is afforded by a sovereign with certain conditions that are deemed to be appropriate. So to connect this concept and understand the climate of the time period, we can go to the Levantine Adventure of the Travels and Missions of the Chevalier d'Arbu, 1653 to 1697 by Warren H. Lewis. So this is from the same time period, but instead of looking at the so-called British colonies, which were far from being British, in the United States, or prior to the United States, being formed by the Constitution, this book looks at the lens of the Levant and the republics that inspired much of what we see today, or, or much of what the... Uh, dream was of the people that founded the United States, which is based off of, off, off of the North African republics, often contemptuously called pirate republics by the propagandistic historians of today. On page 14, it states, It had been a curious episode, one which showed how even so near home as Italy Seamen troubled themselves very little as to whether their countries were at peace or at war. The battle in which Darvu took play, part was in 1653. France and Holland were not only at peace, but as recently as 1648 they had been allied in the war against Spain. Now for the pretext to this, the French ship, the Postillon, was attacked by a Dutch ship. In continuation, another instance of this queer indifference to events in the West occurred at Smyrna in 1705 at the height of the Spanish Succession War in which England and Holland were allied against France. On February 11th, the French warship Notre Dame, lying in Smyrna Roads, received news that two English merchantmen were about to enter the port. The English consul, advised of this, called upon his French colleague and got him to persuade the captain of the Notre Dame to allow the English ships to enter unmolested, on a promise that the English would repay this good turn in the first time positions were reversed. Two days later, Notre Dame sailed and on our way out to sea exchanged salutes with some Dutch vessels, which had apparently been using the harbor without any protest from the captain of the Notre Dame. The spirit in this case seems to have been that whilst war is all very well in its way, business was business. Now, in a different section, 
the author points to or explains in a phrase rather sums up in a phrase the idea of what we're looking at with the wars for independence and the rise of merchant republics which is essentially what the united states was intended to be along with all of the other uh republics that were formed but then came back under the fold of colonial empire here it states uh, on page 175 Colbert, that master planner, did great things for France, but on the long-term view, his record is one of failure, for he was obsessed by the belief that commercial supremacy could be won by rigid state control of every detail of the means of production and distribution. He took it as axiomatic that if his orders, drafted on the best expert advice, were clear and decisive, and if obedience to them was ruthlessly enforced, the whole delicate business of trading with Orientals could be controlled by himself from an office in Paris. The English company, said Colbert, was successful. Therefore, a French company, better organized than the English one, would have a proportionately greater success. But there was this fatal defect in his reasoning, namely that, the, that he did not understand the vital difference between the spirit of the English company and the one which he proposed to set up. Because the Dutch and English operated under state patronage, he had assumed that their operations were controlled by their respective governments, whereas, in fact, they were flexible self-disciplined associations of merchants acting for their own common profit. So one way that we could look at this time period from what he just stated there at the end of that paragraph is that an undeclared government was formed among marine or naval merchants and sailors where there was a general understanding among people of, of the various navies and um, companies around the world in which they would flout declarations of war and they would carry on whatever they wanted to do based off of their own decisions and their own treaties that they would make without dec uh, recognition of being an actual state so to speak the nation state concept but practically they did and probably still do in many ways exist but the same heavy-handed tyrants that ruled at that time still do so today and attempt to, to continue implementing the same concept of colonial empire now we come to a interesting situation that also describes the I suppose you could say hatred of the aristocracy that in many ways still exists today and also that the most ardent enemies of the european powers were europeans themselves september 15 1682 was mail day in aleppo and a few of darvu's letters can have given him more satisfaction than the one informing him that retribution had at last fallen upon Baba Hassan and his Algerians. Since the Divan of Algiers had succeeded in forcing a disadvantageous treaty on the Dutch in 1680, that assembly had grown steadily more insolent until on October 18, 1681, it had had the impudence to declare war on Louis XIV. Regardless of the fact that at that moment the French fleet had no serious work on hand, what was worse from the French point of view was that this impudent declaration was rapidly followed by a series of Algerian victories. Before the end of November, the pirates operating out of Algiers had taken 29 French ships, whose crews totaled 300, and early in December the Admiral of Algiers had arrived in port with a captured French warship. This was bad enough, in all conscience, but when early in the summer of 1682 Louis received the news that her commander, the Chevalier de Beaujou, had been sold by auction in Algiers' slave market. An immense rage filled him. No lesser punishment, he wrote, than the extermination of this nest of vipers would satisfy him. Duquesne was to lead his squadron to Algiers without argument and without delay. Torville, who was to join forces with him there, was hounded out of Toulon, where he was waiting to be made up to strength. You will in future follow your orders exactly without interpreting them, and every bombing gallio the new French secret weapon, was to accompany the force. But it was not until August 5th that Duquesne was in position to attack the Algerians, 
and when he did so, he met with only moderate success. The bombing officer, though showing great zeal, knew nothing of naval matters. The bombs exploded well off their targets. Galleys collided. A bomb exploded on board the Cruel. In short, the operation had to be called off. However, the second one, on August 30th, was a very different story. All five bomb galleots were in action, supported by 11 ships of the line, and 114 bombs landed in the town, destroying 200 houses as well as both mosques and killing several hundred people. On September 3rd, Baba Hassan launched a counterattack mounted from the shipping in the harbor, which was driven off with heavy loss, and the French re retorted with another bombardment of the town more deadly than the first. According to reports from within Algiers, this bombing demolished another hundred houses and killed a further 700 townsfolk. Terror and consternation spread everywhere, though according to one version, the morale of the Algerians remained high. On September 12th, Duquesne, who was running out of supplies, sailed for France, leaving four ships to blockade the port during the winter. To finish off the story of Algiers, we may here anticipate the campaigns of 1683 and 1684. In 1683, Louis, determined that there should be no half-measures that year, gave his admiral everything he asked for, 17 ships of the line, 3 frigates, 7 bomb galleo, 16 galleys, and various fleet auxiliaries, which brought the total of the tax force up to 122 sail. And best of all, no gentlemen volunteers, these sort of people, wrote Duquesne, all expect tables, beds, and chairs, which take up valuable space and are a great nuisance. Tidings of the assembly of such an armada could not be kept secret, and Baba Hassan was sufficiently alarmed at the news to persuade the governor of the Bastion and Consul Levacher to plead with Louis XIV. That'd be Consul Levacher, probably. But needless to say, his this Dimash was unfruitful, and on June 18, Duquesne reappeared before Algiers. On the 26th, he opened his attack with a hail of bombs of 15 pounds each on the mole, the lighthouse, enemy shipping, and the town, as dead on the targets as if each bomb had been placed by hand. The slaughter in Algiers was terrific, and women carried their husbands' heads and their children's limbs to Baba Hassan, brandishing daggers which they promised to plunge into his heart if he did not sue for peace instantly. The militia refused to face the deadly fire of the Franks alone after the other inhabitants had fled to the surrounding country. And to crown all, at this critical moment, a bomb burst in Baba Hassan's house. By now, the Pasha had intervened with a summons to Baba to put a stop to the disaster, and Baba, much perplexed, released Bujol and asked for his advice. Ask her pardon, replied the French officer curtly, and Baba Hassan saw that there was nothing for it but swallow his unpalatable advice. Duquesne, however, who had been reinforced by Noé with 16 galleys, refused to listen to him until 547 French slaves had been brought on board his squadron, and when they had, he demanded in addition the return of all French shipping held in Algiers, together with an indemnity of 200,000 livres, or pounds sterling, whichever you prefer, to which Baba San with tears replied, and no doubt truthfully, that to raise such a sum was an utter impossibility. But for answer was told by Duquesne that if the indemnity was not paid forthwith, the cost of fitting out the French task force would be added to the sum demanded. At this stage, the Algerian hostage for the Pour Palais intervened. This hostage, none other than our old friend Mezzo Morte, now said that if he was allowed to go ashore, he undertook to accomplish more in a quarter of an hour than Baba San would in a fortnight, and he and Baba were given leave to depart. Mezzo Morte certainly accomplished a great deal, but not at all what Duquesne had intended. He raised the town, provoked a mutiny in the militia, murdered Baba Hassan, assembled the divan, and broke off all negotiations with all negotiations with Duquesne. For his bad faith, the French retaliated on July 21st by staging a non-stop day and night bombardment of the town, and a week, at the price of 20 men killed and 78 wounded, had obliterated a quarter of the place, burnt three warships, a galley on the stocks, 12 merchantmen, and killed another 300 Algerians. But this action had one tragic result. On July 28th, the tormented and frightened townspeople hunting for a scapegoat noticed Consul Le Vacher's linen hung out to dry on the seaward side of the consulate. The cursed Frank is signaling to his compatriots, they screamed, and without more ado, the unfortunate man was dragged before Mezzo Morte, sentenced to death, stripped, and blown from the mouth of their largest cannon. On, sus on subsequent days, 16 French prisoner of prisoners of war met the same fate as Le Vacher, splattering the decks of the French ships with their fragments. Algiers continued to resist throughout the autumn and winter. Tourville, now commander-in-chief, waged a war without mercy, but it was not until April 5, 1684, that the Day and Devon were forced to sign a peace treaty, which put France in. So, looking at the situation of today, 
in contrast to the other time period, one wonders what country today would be considered independent and sovereign. Here it states under ThoughtCo, non-member countries of the United Nations, thus Holy See is the only fully independent nation to choose not to be a member of the United Nations. States without non-member observer status, unlike the UN's official permanent observers, these states are not recognized by the UN. However, they are recognized as independent states by some of the UN's members, Kosovo. So that would be like these merchant republics or this merchant network that we see throughout the various patterns of conduct in the 17th and 18th century where it was an unrecognized state of sailors who had formed essentially practically their own sort of maritime government. Countries not in the United Nations 2022. It's actually quite, well, you could probably say this with a valley girl. It's actually quite unusual for a country to exist without becoming a member of the United Nations simply because one of the required steps in becoming a country is to be recognized by the United Nations. Isn't that special? Imagine that declaration. You're not a country unless they recognize you as a country. And the only independent state from the UN is the Vatican City, and allegedly Palestine, although that's not true. So there you go. There's the practical sovereign of today, at least recognized in our fraudulent colonial system that we live under. It is, in fact, the empire of the Vatican. That's what we're looking at. Here we get clarification on this point. In the United States District Court, Northern District of California, Emil Epperin et al. versus Vatican Bank, aka Institute of Religious Works, or Instituto per le Opere de Religione, which of course would be Institute for the Operation of Religion, not the Institute of Religious Works. This is a declaration of Professor Settimio Carmignani Caridi in support of defendant IOR's motion to dismiss Fourth Amendment complaint for lack of subject matter jurisdiction. Now, it's interesting that they recognize non-human entities as being capable of doing such a thing as submitting a motion, right? The IOR is, in fact, a fictitious person and is managed by human individuals. Those human individuals are the ones that, practically speaking, submit such motions, not a fictitious entity. But either way, it's all about hiding uh, activities that violate sovereignty of basically everyone around the globe. Here it states, under authority and constitutional expression in the Holy See's legal system and on the territory of the state of Vatican City. The Holy See is a sovereign confessional state governed by canon law and constitutional law. Its sovereignty is recognized by other states throughout the world, including the United States. The political form of the state is a monarchy. Thank you. If you have enjoyed this video, please check out my other content, such as my published books. Also, there are free books available at the link, and if so choose, you so choose, you may support my work at PayPal or buy me a coffee. Well, actually, Cash App. I don't have access to PayPal. Thank you.